20 years ago, I got in the environmental business. I was then director of our lab here for manufacturing and productivity, and I was fortunate enough to get an invitation from the National Science Foundation to get involved in an international study on what we call then an environmentally benign manufacturing. This was shortly after the Kyoto Protocol. You remember that one? And uh, companies were motivated by this and looking into what they could do. And uh, to my great pleasure, I was invited to be part of this international study to visit these companies. They were all over the world, but concentrated a lot in Japan and Western Europe, and also we went to North America. These were big companies. They had not only research projects, but some of these things, some of their ideas moved into production. We visited more than 50 different companies, and after a while, the themes started to emerge. We had to become more efficient so we could conserve resources, both energy and materials. We had to recycle so we could displace or at least substitute for energy-intensive primary materials with secondary materials, and we had to substitute renewables for fossil fuel, and more. So in sum, there was no silver bullet. We had to do all of these things. But after we did the report, that was a great experience, I started to wonder, well, exactly how does this play out? When we make an engineering intervention in society, when we develop a new energy-efficient light bulb, for example, what happens? Now, this picture, if you're this young lad who, here who's using a 3-watt LED light bulb to read his book instead of a 100-watt incandescent light bulb, we know we're saving energy. But what happens in between when you scale this up to the size of the planet? Well, we rolled up our sleeves and we did what I would call investigative reporting with thermal dynamics. We started out first close to home, looking at manufacturing processes, product design. Then we started to look at materials production, buildings, factories, universities, renewable energy, energy sectors, and ultimately we looked at different lifestyles. What was the energy carbon, and environmental impact of different lifestyles. Let me give you an example that represents our findings. In one of our studies, we looked at efficiency improvements in 11 different activities that use energy resources. We looked at the materials production sector, in particular iron, aluminum, and nitrogen fertilizer. We looked at electricity production by different fuels. We looked at appliances, refrigerators, and then we added another study, not ours, on lighting. And then we looked at transportation, autos, freight rail, and aviation. In order to portray these results, we came up with a framework. But first, I wanted to make it clear that these technologies had all, over their lifetime, improved substantially in efficiency. This is just a picture of pig iron production, which has been in production for a long time, over 200 years, has gone down by more than a factor of 25. Other sectors have gone down by a factor of 100 and even 1,000. So the efficiency improvements have been very dramatic. We came up with a framework where we plotted changes in demand versus changes in efficiency. And so if efficiency was increasing faster than demand, we'd be in the green triangle and end up using less, conserving. If demand is increasing faster than efficiency, then we're in the red triangle, consuming more and emitting more carbon. Where do you think they lined up? I moved the axis here to make room for all the data points. They're all in the red. Some are sort of close. That's good. Now, these are long-term averages over decades, and in some cases, centuries. But they're all, in an absolute sense, these activities are using more energy, in spite of very impressive efficiency gains. How does this work? 
Well, if we're all like the young lad I showed you earlier and replacing energy-intensive light bulbs with energy-efficient light bulbs, we would have gotten in the green triangle. But there's more to the picture. Energy-efficient light bulbs are an opportunity. We can now light up a parking lot. And you can feel safe going there at night, even if you've got the last car in the parking lot. We can light up a softball field at night. And on a hot, humid night in the Midwest, where I come from, you can play a softball game. And that might be the best part of the day. You can also make a scoreboard that's the whole length of the football field and nine football players high. Now, let me be clear about this. Every one of these has economic benefits. It produces jobs. So it's not all black and white. But every one of these ends up using more energy. This is what we missed. The human appetite. We want more. Sigmund Freud was aware of this back in 1930s. He wrote a book called Civilization and Its Discontents, where he talks about the conflict between our animal spirits and the requirements that we have to constrain ourselves somewhat to live in society and have a productive society. This could play out in spades as we try to address climate change. The other message this is saying is life is complicated. Even though you and I want to save energy, there is a lot more going in our life than just saving energy. We have to put food on the table. We have to have shelter. We want safety. It's complicated. One way to demonstrate this complication is to refer to the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. 17. That's a big number. And they're all interconnected. If I were to pull on one, it drags on a few more. So we have to figure out how to manage this. You know, 17, I was astonished when I first saw this. 17 is such a big number. Isn't there a rule where you're not supposed to come up with more than seven things in a list because people won't remember them? So I wrote these down so we could go through them. But look at them. Poverty, hunger, health. I'm going to skip a couple. Education, water, sanitation, energy, industrialization, development. Haven't we been working on these? Not that we've solved them, but haven't we been working on these kind of problems for some time? Yes, we have. We've been working on them in functioning governments. In functioning governments, representative, accountable governments, you can make these complex trade-offs between this vast array of conflicting goals. All right? So I'm going to reverse what I told you earlier. I think there is a silver bullet. It's called a functioning government. Now, not all of those problems are the kind we've been working on. And in fact, even the ones I listed now have the sustainability sort of component to them. All right? So we haven't exactly been solving the sustainability problem. But we have been solving problems like that. And so that's why we have the wheelbarrow coming in with new problems like climate change. And this is going to require not only a functioning government here, but a functioning government in other places so we can network to solve these kinds of global problems. So let me show you what we can do if we have a functioning government. Let's go back to the picture I showed you, the very disappointing picture, and let's tease out a little bit more information. The news is not all bad. These are long-term averages. But the more granular data reveals patterns and how we can move the needle. So I'm going to look at two that I've circled there, residential refrigerators and motor vehicle travel. Now, if you tease out the data by decades for refrigerators, you see some interesting patterns. We were red for a long time, and now we're green. Whoa, how does that happen? In fact, if you look, we went in negative direction on efficiency. We added features that people wanted that used more energy. People wanted freezers in their refrigerators. They wanted self-de-icing. Uh, they wanted defrosting. They wanted ice machines. Okay. But eventually, how did we get into the green? Well, this is during the era of the OPEC oil embargo. This raised energy prices made us concerned about being rely, uh, reliant on outside 
entities for our energy supply, and so we put into effect efficiency mandates. This first came about in California. It was adopted nationally. So every couple of years, people get together and say, what's the efficiency target for, re for refrigerators? And they move the needle, and as you can see clearly, we're in the green triangle. And we've stayed there for quite a while. I'll give you another example. Automobiles. This has that same feature where for a while we were going backwards because people wanted... We started with, what, four cylinders, then we want six, then we want eight. But eventually we started to move. And again, during the same era, the OPEC oil embargo era, we had both high fuel costs and corporate average fuel economy standards, the earlier version of that. And you can see we started moving very significantly in the right direction. Now, we didn't quite make it. We ended too soon. They expired, and we said, well, that's enough of that. Let's go back to big cars. And you can see in what direction we went. The evidence is there that we know how to do this. So what's the bottom line? We need to negotiate these complex issues. We're going to have to have a functioning government. We know there's plenty of evidence of what happens when you try to raise fuel prices and inequality is large. It's happening right now. Okay, we have to address inequality. To solve climate? Yes, to solve climate. It's a complex problem. There are functioning governments. In terms of climate change, for example, there are 550 cities that have signed up for the Paris Accord. 22 states, 900 companies, and hundreds of universities. So you can work locally. You can go to your town, you can go to your university, you can go to your company and see what they're doing. That's where I get hope. I get enormous satisfaction working locally. You learn something about climate change and you learn something about politics. You run into it immediately. But you can get a sense of satisfaction, you can get a sense of effectiveness. What you can do with a functioning government is reorient our appetite so it's not working against us, but so it's working to solve the problem with the right incentives. We've got two, two, two possible solutions. Constrain our appetite or reorient it. We'll probably have to do a little bit of both. Finally, I haven't said anything about technology, but I want to mention that. Because too many times I've heard, we got all the technology answers, don't worry about it. That's not true. If you were to compare the energy options we're offering right now compared to a gas, gallon of gasoline, forget about carbon for a moment, they're a bad bargain. They've got a lot of improvement to do. By standard measures, energy density, land use requirements, intermittency, we've got a long way to go. So don't give up on technology. We've got a lot of technology things to do. So enjoy yourself tonight. Party hardy tomorrow. Go see what your local organization is going to do about climate change. Get involved. As my brother Tom said to me when I forced him to listen to my talk for the second time, <laughs> get a glove and get in the game.